Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm going to explain to you what is the permanent OL. And if you accidentally have clicked on this video because you want to know what is a determinant, don't worry. I will also tell you what is a determinant or what is the difference between the permanent and the determinant. Um, so let's just jump right into it. The permanent is basically the determinant without the sign. So if you know where the determinant comes from, um, the determinant is kind of measuring how the unit area, uh, uh, the area of the unit square changes or unit cube changes under the action of a matrix. And there's always a funny sign in, so this is a formula for the permanent that I'm going to explain in the example in a second. The example is already here. Um, and this is the formula for the determinant, a little bit in grayish. And the only difference is that there is a sign which is a little bit mysterious. If you, if you just see this formula in, well, out of the blue, right? So this is, this is really weird. Why should this be interesting in any way? It looks crazy. It's the sum of a permutations of a product of things. It's, and even with the sign, um, this looks a little bit better. It's still the same, but you just get rid of the sign. And this is the determinant. And the blue one is called the permanent. And it will turn out that they are, in some sense, dual to each other. There's something called McMahon's master theorem. Um, <laughs> gives you a relationship between the two. There's something called Gauss-Joule duality. It gives you a relationship between the two. Um, but this is not really important. The important part here is that if, if you believe that the determinant is a natural definition, and it is because it's kind of measuring areas of certain squares, uh, of certain images of, of squares on, on the matrices, then maybe the permanent is also a very nice definition. And uh, it will be a crucial difference, which is it's extremely fun. But, but before we go to that, let me explain what the what the permanent is. So it's basically defined by this bl bluish formula, the same formula as the green formula, but without the sign. And the way to compute it is as follows. So the sum here runs over all elements of the symmetric group, and you just write them down. In this case, a uh, symmetric group with three elements has three, uh, three fractorial elements, there are six elements. And you just write them down in this string notation, which is a very powerful notation. It works as follows. So the string notation just says, uh, I permute one to the second position. So this is permutation one to the second position. Okay. I permute two to the third position. Okay. Maybe I should do this in blue, whatever. Um, I permute two to the third position and I permute three to the first position. Right? So this diagram is just another way of encoding this permutation, right? It, permutation is just a shuffling of cards. You have three cards, they're named one, two, three. And you shuffle them in some way. And shuffling just means um, you, you basically have a string starting somewhere at, at your card one and you put it somewhere else, right? This is what this picture is about. So I pull the string one to the second position so I, I have just shuffled one and two. And I pull two to the third position, I pull three to the first position and so on. For example, here, I would pull one to the last position, uh, two stays where it is, and I pull three to the first position. And this is just a really handy and very powerful way to encode the symmetric group. And all you do now to calculate the, so first of all, for the determinant, you would have to calculate a sign, but for the permanent, you don't care. So there is no sign. And the only thing you need to do is you need to look at those pictures and need to do the following. So let's do this one. So you write down one, two, three, and your matrix is just denoted in the usual way, A11, A12, A13, and so on. So you have one, two, three just the product of all of them. And you're only worried about the second entry. So it's always one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on. And you only worry about what to put in the second slot. And you let the permutation tell you what to put in the second slot. So this fixes one. 
one. This exchanges two and three, so you exchange two and three. Right, so let's do this one. This sends one to two, two. This sends two to three, three. This sends three to one, one. This sends one to three, three. Uh, two to one, one. Three to two, two, and so on. And you just take the huge sum of all of them. And that's what you call the permanent of the matrix. Uh, it's a very similar definition as a determinant, as I said. For the determinant, you will throw in some signs here. So the only difference between this definition and the one for the determinant is that here, those red things would be minuses for the determinant, not for the permanent. The, for the permanent, they're all pluses. But in some sense, the permanent was much easier to compute. Everything is just summed up. There are no minus signs whatsoever. And look up something funny, something something really, there's, there's not really good explanation why this is happening. It's kind of, kind of a fact of life, if you want. Um, so the determinant is known to have some geometric properties. It's measuring certain areas, certain volumes. And if you throw out the sign, you would expect that maybe the permanent is also measuring something, some ge geometric properties. Not to my, to the best of my knowledge, it's it's not. It's measuring combinatorial properties. Com in stark contrast to the per determinant, which doesn't really have a good combinat. Well, in some, it has some combinatorial um, explanations, just because the notion of com what is combinatorial is a little bit is a little bit vague anyway. <laughs> but um, yeah, but the permanent really is a, is a combinatorial gadget that you, it, it counts certain things, and it's it's amazing what you can count with a, with a, with a permanent. While the determinant is is about geometry rather than counting, and it's it's kind of a weird thing, right? You just throw out a sign and you go from geometry to to counting. Uh, so I I totally love this, of course. Um, so let let me give you an example of what you can count. So let's say you have uh, you have the following problem. Here's a riddle. I give you some time to think about it. So what, what the answer could be, it's not so easy. I mean, it's a finite problem, you can do it, but it, it, it's not so easy in general. And um, the answer is pretty amazing. Um, so let's say you have a set of sets. Well, in this case, uh, case, I have a set X and it's made out of seven sets. One, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they're all filled with numbers. Let's say in this case from one to seven to make our lives easier. And you're just wondering how many different ways are there to choose an element of each set. I want to choose something from here, from here, from here, from here, from here, here, and here, such that they are all distinct. Right? You have a certain number of sets. You are allowed to grab into each set and pull something out. And whatever you pull out for each set, you want to have to dis distinguished elements. You never want to pull out, let's say, uh, three and three here. So this this would be a bad choice. That seems to be, uh, well, and then how many ways are there to do this? This is a classic, kind of a really, really classical question you would, you would ask in, in some combinatoric setup. The, the set could stand for something different or whatever. So this is really a classical question in combinatorics. And if you think about it a little bit, it's not so easy to construct actually an example and left aside just counting how many there are. I mean, it's if you think about it a little bit, it's pretty clear that you, you, you should choose three from this set, otherwise you're dead, of course, because he has no other choice. But then it gets a bit, pff, I don't really know. So if you want to take a seven, can you take it from, from one of those sets here? And in what order? And maybe you should start from taking a seven here because um, you already need to choose a three here and so on. But, <laughs> It's, you kind of list all possibilities. And listing all possibilities is usually not a good way of doing it. Here's the better way of doing it. Um, you write down a matrix, here's my matrix. And basically it works as follows. In the first column, you just write zero whenever you don't see the element in the first set. And you write one whenever the element appears in the first set. So no ones, no twos, oh yes, there's a three, no fours, yes, there's a five, yes, there's a six, yes, there's a seven. And you just continue for the, uh, along the rows for, for each other one. So let's say this one. Yes, there is a one, no, there is a 
there's no two, there's no three, there's no four, yes, there's a five, no, there's no six, yes, there's a seven, and so on. And so you write down the seven by seven matrix, and the permanent of this matrix is exactly the number of ways you can uh, you, you can choose distinct thing, uh, distinct elements. And this is just now an algorithm, right? You just run it on a computer, for example, and it tells you, oh, it's two. Uh, it's pretty nice. It's a pretty cute answer, but it's really, really different from what you expect from a uh, from a from a determinant. Determinant would count some area. This is counting basically ways of, of choosing elements. And this is just one of many examples. So here's another one, just just for you, right? So you can write down. You can ask um, if you have some natural looking matrix like like this one. It's very easy. Just zeros on the diagonal and ones everywhere else. And obviously that makes sense for for any dimension and you just write down the permanent. So the permanent is zero, well, for the zero cross zero matrix, uh, for the one cross one matrix is a zero on the diagonal, then it gets one, then it gets two, uh, and then it's nine, and, and it grows very fast. And it's, we have seen permutation diagrams before, um, and this counts the number of fixed point free permutations, for example, another very classical counting problem. So what are the, permutations of, of uh, four cards that do not fix any cards. It, it at least shuffles something somewhere, like one and twos and two and one, right? Uh, four and three are also swapped. What I wouldn't count here is, for example, such a diagram which would look like this, because here one would be fixed, right? So that's what I don't like. And I kind of want to count how many there are, and it turns out the answer is again the permanent. And this is not so easy. It, it was. It isn't so easy to write down those nine diagrams to calculate the permanent of this matrix. Will take you, well, not too long. Maybe a minute. Well, maybe two minutes. But it will take a computer a, a fraction of a second to write down those nine diagrams. Is a little bit of a pain. They look very nice in the end if you if you have done this like like I did. Uh, but it's a bit of a pain. So the permanent always is always counting something in contrast to the determinant, which is which is a geometric, geometric notion. And the formal definition of the permanent of the, and of the determinant looks exactly the same. Um, there's a unique function, yeah, you know, and it's non-trivial that it exists, but I just showed you. So this is the, the formula that proves existence. Um, but it, it's, it's the same definition. So you would have this definition for the determinant as well. You would have this definition for the determinant, so this property, not definition, this property for the determinant as well. And the only difference is that it is symmetric, not anti-symmetric. So if so, this is the difference. So if you swap columns in the permanent, then the permanent stays the same. If you swap columns, columns in the determinant, um, then the determinant swaps sides. That's the only difference between between the two. So this is really only up to a sign. And what is so magic about this whole thing is that one is doing geometry and the other one is doing combinatorics, and it's all about a sign. Yeah. Otherwise, it's exactly the same definition, has the same properties. It's calculated using very similar algorithms. Um, more counting. Let me just finish you finish with with, with more counting. Um, so. Each graph is basically a matrix, okay? So here's a graph and it works as follows. So you would, so graph is just a collection of, of, of vertices. So you have eight vertices here and a certain number of edges. Um, and the way you can associate to a graph a, a matrix is called adjacency matrix, it's called using the adjacency matrix. And this is just saying the following. So it gives your, your, your vertices certain numbers and you look, well, one is connected to two, so you put an entry one in the corresponding um, the slot of the matrix. Two is connected to one, so you put a one in the corresponding slot of the matrix. And you get the adjacency matrix uh, of the graph. So, so let, me, let me say this is G, and then you get the adjacency matrix of G. And you could compute the permanent of this matrix of the adjacency matrix. And in this case, you get something like uh, nine squared. 
And this is what is called a bipartite graph. Don't worry about it too much. It's basically saying you can you can color things in a in a in a two color way. Uh, so uh, let me just say I would would do it this way. So I have one color which is gray, which wasn't really a good choice of color, but whatever. And let's say one color that is blue, and you can color the vertices gray and blue, such that um, gray is only neighbor to blue, and blue is only neighbor to gray. And in this case, the permanent counts what is called perfect matchings. So those nine here are exactly those nine diagrams. And the perfect matching is nothing else than, a than exactly what you see here. Like for each vertex, you as associate exactly one partner, right? Such that they, they, they give you um, a disconnected, a disconnected subgraph, right? So here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, and they're disconnected. And you count all those ways. And there are zillions others of examples what's a permanent count. It's, it, again, I say it, it's really amazing. You just throw out a sign from the definition of, of the determinant and you get something that counts instead of something that, that measures area. Um, yeah, but that's it for today. And thank you very much. See you next time.